So I wonder this morning, what are your weaknesses? What things tempt you? I am not a huge fan of chocolate, but open a bag of gummy bears and I can polish them off. I like red licorice, not those silly red vines, not red vines, they have to be Twizzlers, jelly beans, peanut brittle, until I discovered peanuts give me migraines, so almond brittle or just the brittle without the nuts. Sugar is my weakness, not chocolate so much. Or Facebook seems to be my weakness lately. I've started watching the reels, which are short videos, 30 seconds, two minutes long. I blame Rachel, by the way. I started watching them when Rachel started posting youth group videos, and then I've gotten sucked in. They show you how to stage a better photo, how to stretch for running better, how to dress better. I think it's weird, by the way, that the rage right now is to wear a fanny pack around your shoulder so that it's here under your arm. It's weird enough to put it around your waist now to have it here. I just don't get it. These videos are huge time wasters for me, a weakness. Or thrift store store shopping is a weakness for me. I'm struggling right now with my clothing choices, so I've been looking at my favorite thrift stores for that perfect top that's going to make getting ready for work easier every day. Spoiler alert, I haven't found it yet. I have four pairs of black pants and two pairs of gray pants that are almost exactly alike, but no sweaters or tops to wear with them right now when I'm cold and none of my sweaters fit well, or they itch, or they, right? So I shop. Temptations are all around us, aren't they? In the last five years, I've had four people who've shared their struggle with alcoholism with me. Each story is different, and each story isn't ended yet. But after each person shared their story with me, I began to notice a little bit more how much alcohol use and abuse is pushed and even glorified everywhere we look. It's the beer vendors at the game. It's the mommy needs wine t-shirts at the store. It's the idea that you can't get through a holiday without self-medicating on wine or spirits. Alcohol use is everywhere, and my friends who struggle with alcohol abuse see that temptation every time they turn around. We're tempted each and every day to indulge in our food choices. Why have mashed potatoes when you can have fully loaded mashed potatoes with cheese and bacon and chives on top? Why have green beans from a can when you can have sauteed green beans with garlic or almost famous green bean fries or green beans with warm bacon vinaigrette? We face temptations every day, indulge a little more, Buy a little more, drink a little more, eat a little more, be a little more selfish. You deserve it, after all. The good news is we're not alone in our temptations. At the beginning of his ministry, Jesus embraced his humanity as he followed the Spirit into the wilderness to meet the devil. Our story picks up right after Jesus was baptized by John. It's before his ministry has even started. Matthew demonstrated the royal lineage of Jesus in the first chapter of his writing. He is the son of Abraham, the son of David, the son of exiles, son of those who returned. In the genealogy, he shares that uh, Jesus is the son of a prostitute, the survivor of rape, an adulterer and murderer, and captives, rebuilders, the occupied, and of course, the son of a carpenter. Then Matthew shares that his mother is in on this lineage as well. She fulfills the prophecy to bring about the son whom Jesus, whom Joseph accepted, named and makes his own. We meet foreign magi in the first chapters of Matthew who seek Jesus, who follow a star and who give him gifts. The family flees from the king, then returns to Nazareth in Galilee where he grows up and approaches cousin John who protests but ultimately baptizes him. Here in this moment of baptism, a voice from heaven claims, this is my beloved. All of that in three chapters. Matthew has set the stage with who Jesus is. Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, and he does so before we get to this passage. Before Jesus can begin his ministry, there's one final thing that he must do. Like Noah, who was on the boat for 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus must go with where the Spirit leads. 
Like Moses, Jesus must fast. Moses, you remember, went to the top of the mountain where he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights before God met him and gave him the Ten Commandments. Like Elijah, Jesus must fast. Elijah fasted for 40 days and 40 nights as he fled the king and went to Mount Horeb. Like the Israelites who wandered for 40 years, Jesus must go into the desert. And he does. Jesus goes into the wilderness and fasts like his ancestors before him. Our tradition of fasting during Lent comes from this time in the wilderness. We join the ancestors before us, giants in the faith like Moses and Elijah and Jesus, who refrained from eating while they focused their attention on God. We don't quite fast like they do, or maybe you do, I do not. We give up chocolate or sodas or gummy bears, but notice, notice that their fasting was done alone. Moses went alone onto the mountain. Elijah went alone from the king's palace to the high place. Jesus was led from the riverside alone to the wilderness, alone to face whatever may come, to prepare for his ministry, to spend time with God. Do you embrace the time that you have alone or do you honestly fear it? We're usually pretty good about surrounding ourselves with people. We go shopping together, go to the movies together. We read the Bible together. We study scripture together. Together is good. We are created for relationship and for community. But are you so busy being with people that you don't embrace your solitude? What about your alone time with God that sets you up to face the temptations of the world? I challenge you this Lenten season to pay attention to that alone time. Go with Jesus into a time set apart from others around you, focusing on God and listening for God's voice. Jesus goes into the wilderness and it's there that he meets the devil. Here, between his baptism and his ministry, Matthew shows us the reality of evil in the face of holiness. Let's talk about that evil. The devil is described here using a verbal noun. It joins together two Greek words, dia and balo, which together essentially means to throw over or across. In broader usage, it came to mean one who attacks, misleads, deceives, diverts, discredits, or slanders. In this temptation story, the devil just does just that. He attempts to mislead Jesus about the meaning of sonship and the, and the purposes of God. Now, we can talk about whether or not there's an actual being called the devil with pointy ears and a long tail. We can have long discussions about the evil personified and the existence of a devil and angels, but to do so would miss the point of Matthew's passage. For Matthew, the devil exists and tempted Jesus, period, end of discussion. The reality is that evil attacks, misleads, and deceives us every day. The reality is evil attempts to mislead us about the meaning of our place as God's children and about God's purposes for us in the world. The reality is whether or not you believe in a little being with horns, evil exists and we can name it as the devil or we can name it as capitalism or racism or we can name it as gummy bears and it's still there. Jesus is tempted by bread for his hunger. Jesus is tempted to save himself from danger. Jesus is tempted to take all of the power in the world that the devil can offer. And each time, Jesus rejects the temptation. Each time, Jesus used the words of scripture, the words of Moses, to reject the temptation and stand strong in the face of the lies the devil speaks, in the face of the ways he tries to deceive and divert and discredit Jesus. You and I are a little different from Jesus, in case you haven't noticed already. We can't imagine the devil offering bread after fasting for 40 days. We don't know the fear of being held over the ledge of the Empire State Building. We don't know the temptation of being offered all the power in the world. But we know temptation. We know the temptation of pride, of vanity, of selfishness, of apathy. We know the temptation of looking around at our neighbors and deciding that 
we need to be more like them, we don't have enough. We know the temptation to judge people who make decisions that we don't understand. We know the temptation to look away from those in need and live our lives unaffected by poverty and hunger and disease and war around us. We know the temptation to allow our temper to define our lives. We know the temptations to let addictions to wealth, power, influence over others, vanity, or the need to control. We know the temptation to justify the little lies, the small sins of racist jokes, of questionable business practices, of criticizing our spouse when they aren't around. Those are all temptations that the devil dangles at us and invites us to give in to. Every day we face temptation and we make decisions just as Jesus did. When Jesus had his heart-to-heart -heart conversation with the devil, he stood strong and he didn't give in. But how did he do it? In response to each temptation, Jesus put God first. He reminded us not to test God and to worship God alone. Jesus turned down an easy fix and took up his call to live like one of us. Jesus turned away from the temptations that the devil dangled before him, and instead he turned towards God. He quoted scripture, and he stood strong. He went back to his ancestors, back to the Bible that formed the foundation of who he was, back to the reality of who God called him to be in those moments at the river. He remembered that God said, you are my beloved. We face our own temptations, don't we? Sometimes they're bigger than gummy bears and new clothes. The painful realization is that our journey is not just the 40 days of Lent, but our journey is the whole of our lives. Every day, we're given opportunities to claim the gift of life that we've been given in Christ, and we, we fall down. We surrender to our own temptations, to our own selfishness, Instead of surrendering to the cross upon which we can nail all of our falling down, all of our brokenness, instead of journeying to the death of self and the, of sin, we wrestle with the, ad, the adversary inside of us, our own willfulness, and we fail. We are tempted and we often fail. Lent invites us to face the temptations in our lives, to name the dark places that we find ourselves in. We are called to confess those times that we have given in to temptations and to seek forgiveness from a God who will forgive. After all, our faith is in a God who invites us to new beginnings each and every day. There's grace and forgiveness for us when we do fail. After all, we too are called God's beloved children, called and claimed at our baptism and standing true in the grace that God offers us. May we be more like Jesus each and every day, who showed us how to take one thing at a time and say, not today, Satan. Not today. Let us pray. God of us all, we often have failed. And yet we know that you call us to love you. Help us to hear your voice, to stand firm on your call, and to choose you above all else. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.